Well, hello. <laughs> Is this the coolest Scala conference ever? I know, I know. I know what you guys are thinking. Who is this awesome guy sitting in the front of the room? Where did he get those rad shades? Well, I'm actually sorry to disappoint you guys, but I'm actually not that cool. But I just want to kind of yeah, illustrate a point here. Um, <laughs> so, so this does have a context to Scala, um, but, but, uh, but I'm going to get there uh, slowly. Um, but my point is basically that um, deducing certain truths about the beauty um, that you see in the things that you make um, only based on a narrow vantage point um, can some, sometimes lead to mistakes or misjudgments. In my case, if you take me and throw me in a party function, your program is likely to throw a runtime error. <laughs> um, but that said, uh, skipping along, OK. Um, so uh, looking at like the, the same kind of uh, um, perspective of view of a certain design uh, from a different perspective, uh, say for another person who may be sitting on a different side of the bus, um, that view may be kind of skewed um, by certain differences. Let's say there's fog on the, uh, on the window that they kind of have to push aside, or there is uh, a set of confusing an obfuscated byte code um, that they kind of have to rearrange and try to understand in order to see your vision. Um, but I thought this idea was kind of interesting, and I thought I would kind of explore it in terms of basically uh, a Java programmer uh, looking back at what a Scala programmer's code generates for them. OK, uh, so where does my story start? My story starts with my mom, uh, as most stories do. Um, and what I really love about moms is the kind of lessons that they teach you as a child kind of come back later on in life and they apply in lots of different contexts. Um, for me, my mom taught me a lot of lessons and those kind of uh, lessons kind of reapply to me in a day-to-day -day basis actually in, the, in what I do for programming. So let's say for instance, always finish what's on your plate. Um, this one I don't adhere to as much as I probably should, but this basically means um, that we all have lots of ideas, we all get really excited about things, but what's important is um, not so much starting those things, but finishing those things. Uh, clean behind your ears, um, keep it clean, uh, otherwise you'll end up with a ball of mud that was mentioned earlier. Um, but one of the more important points, uh, so if you're taking notes, uh, and this will be on the quiz later, um, is to always be mindful of your neighbors. Um, and why I think this one's most important um, is because when applied to basically uh, any problem domain, it creates a, a better world for everyone's future, um, particularly ours. Uh, so how does this apply to, uh, why does this apply to Scala? Um, so though there are many, or not many, there's a handful of different implementations of the Scala programming language, there's a pretty good chance that the one that you use runs on the JVM. Uh, why is this a good choice? The JVM's uh, essentially considered mostly reliable runtime. Um, so, and for that same reason, uh, other languages have adopted it um, as their kind of target runtime platform. Um, so it's probably a good idea uh, whenever designing your code um, that you want to kind of uh, play nice uh, with the other kids frolicking on the program. Um, so you can kind of think of this also as basically uh, a courtesy to others. Um, sometimes I see Scala programmers who look down on Java programmers, it's not so much that the Java programmers are any more primitive. Um, they may just have a different perspective on things. Um, that said, um, when you're playing in the same playground or your code's running in the same, uh, the same basically runtime or whatever, you kind of want to do, it would, you would do yourself a uh, uh, benefit by showing the courtesy to them in the interfaces that you expose um, some extra thought with them in mind. Um, so when it comes to Scala and, uh, and other languages view of Scala, when it comes to Scala hopping on the JVM, um, there's kind of two things that they kind of frown upon. Um, basically, um, giving the JVM's uh, young generation gray hair early. Um, we generate a lot of garbage. As Scala makes it really easy to do that. Um, and also these kind of awkward interfaces, um, which if we tried a little bit harder, um, we can kind of resolve our differences um, with some extra thought. Um, so before I talk about those differences, I guess it's worth mentioning what's universally translatable um, between, I hope anyone got that joke? Okay, no one got that joke. Um, 
So, uh, so in Scala, we have uh, lots of different types um, to work with and to mold with and do what we want with. Um, but uh, so what does translate well to Java is behavior, behaviorless traits. Uh, those are traits without any behavior. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, all three flavors of classes, vanilla classes, abstract classes, and case classes. Case classes actually generate um, an object, but I'll talk about that later. So what doesn't translate well, um, basically uh, everything else that we like about the language, and that's why we use it. Um, but uh, again, I think we can do a little bit better job uh, of thinking about the interfaces that we exposed, and then this is kind of like a small talk about some things to consider whenever you think about this. Um, so, can anyone in the room attach a name to this face? Mark Twain, yeah, good. Bonus points on the quiz. Uh, so yeah, he was kind of uh, known for many things, but uh, one of the things he was known for uh, was dabbling in a pastime called back translations. Uh, back translations are kind of an interesting subject matter. Basically, it's, uh, so say you have a source document, someone translates that to uh, another document in a, di a different language, and then the back translator takes the translation and attempts to translate it back to the original source without the actual uh, source on hand. Um, so, and then it's kind of funny whenever you compare the, the original source with the back translator source, you can kind of see like where the differences lie between the two um, in terms of translation. Um, so, uh, among many tools that the Java runtime provide is this little one called Java P. Uh, Java P will let you kind of inspect class files uh, in the bytecode and then will basically split out, spit out what it thinks uh, what the actual Java source interfaces would look like. Uh, interestingly enough, since uh, the Scala C compiler generates class files and bytecode that the JVM can understand, you can actually point Java P at a Scala translated uh, class file and see what, a Java, uh, what, what it expects the, uh, the Java source file to look like to some degree. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple different features that I like about Scala and things that don't tend to translate well um, when you translate them back to Java from bytecode. Um, so if there was one feature that um, I had to have in Scala and that I could not give up, uh, it would be default arguments. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this type of programming um, pre-Scala 2.8. Um, you do, do this a lot in Java 2, particularly where you don't want to break interfaces, you want to add new behavior but maintain older inter interfaces, and basically we do um, is you override. Uh, so let's say you have a method apply that takes an int, um, and then you build some uh, client code against that. Um, you introduce some new feature. Uh, you don't want to change the usage of the existing uh, interface, so basically you add a new, uh, uh, add a new argument to the method, um, and then you can kind of keep chaining this as you add new features so that you don't break old features. Um, but what it ends up being is a lot of boilerplate, um, and it, it makes you uh, an angry developer. Uh, this is an angry developer uh, at a younger stage. Um, uh, so basically, if the format of the, this talk is kind of like what you see and what you may get. Um, so in a, when taken uh, overboard, uh, you can kind of um, take this, this uh, feature set, which is basically um, allows users of your code to actually not have to pass in any arguments, just give a default to everything. Um, and what that actually generates uh, for your Java users, um, something that's really ugly, it looks something like this. Um, so how many of you are kind of already familiar? This might give me a sense of uh, the, basically, uh, that what Java, what calling, okay, how many of you have kind of had experience calling into Scala from Java code? Okay, more than I thought. So the, the, hopefully someone appreciates this. Um, so basically, uh, whenever you get, um, uh, uh, in, in Scala, you can have uh, basically the same name type under a given package. Uh, you can do this with traits, with classes, uh, or with objects. Um, but actually, this is kind of an illegal thing uh, that you can't do in the Java world. Um, this would, uh, you would run into name collisions, and the way that people typically typically work around this is to uh, namespace namespace things differently. So you kind of get away um, get away from the problem with qualification. Um, but 
what this is doing here is in Scala, um, you can't actually define constants uh, or st static, static methods or whatever. For that, you have a companion object. Um, well, where do you store that for um, basically uh, the arguments of a constructor? Um, there's no state. Um, so Scala generated uh, basically a companion object for me. Um, and it's basically storing those arguments uh, that I set in the, the, uh, the constructor as a default uh, as these kind of long mangled names. Um, so basically, if a Java user wanted to use your code in Java, uh, they don't have the language feature of default arguments um, available to them. So basically, they would be forced to uh, reference these long identifiers if, uh, if they wanted to use your interface. Uh, so that said, uh, it's worth thinking about not going overboard and basically providing default arguments for everything. You probably actually really want to capture the common cases uh, of the, the types of behavior that your, your interfaces would provide. Um, and for the exceptional cases, um, the cases that the, would be like the, the times the method wouldn't be called as often and apply default arguments to those um, because um, that would kind of hide it a little bit more from the Java developers and make them happy and look less like this. Uh, so companion objects. I kind of already alluded to this in the last slide. Um, companion objects, again, they work around this problem where in, in Scala you can't actually have a, a static method or a constant. Um, basically, in Scala you uh, encode that in a companion object. Um, so let's say you have a class bippy, uh, and you have an object bippy. Uh, if you wanted to store a constant for the type bippy, you would most definitely want to put it in the, uh, the, your companion object. That kind of reduces like, the overhead of object allocation. So you wouldn't need to, for each instance of class bippy, to instantiate a new uh, uh, value for each one of these constants. Um, so what does that look in, like in Java? Again, uh, this is the same kind of thing. Scala generates some um, kind of mangled names. Uh, you would reference uh, the singleton object uh, through this uh, bippy type that's uh, kind of uh, has a suffix of a dollar sign and then reference it through this uh, constant member module dollar sign. Um, and basically down here is your vanilla class bippy, um, basically this guy over here. Um, and then you can instantiate that if, as if you would uh, any other class in Java. Um, the sucky thing is that the uh, Java developers would kind of have to uh, indirectly reference these contents through this really uh, ugly name, which kind of sucks. Um, but there's some kind of interesting properties about the way that uh, Scala treats these two, these two things. And I'm going to try to show you a quick demo of something that's a little bit neat. Uh, so companions. So basically, this is like the kind of what you saw on this slide uh, earlier. Um, so let's say we had added some behavior or a method to bippy, let's say, oop. Uh, yeah, sorry. Did not think about that. Is this viewable? Yeah, yeah. OK. So bippy says boop, and bippy returns uh, get class, get name. If I go back to here, this should automatically give me a boop. OK, um, so now, uh, from, a Java's, uh, from a Java de developer's perspective, um, you kind of have this boop member, which basically delegates into your companion object's uh, boop. I'm going to fast forward ahead um, because I'm running out of time. But another interesting property is what happens whenever Bippy defines a boop. Uh, I was really short on time. Um, basically, uh, the Java class steals that boop method uh, and makes it an instance method. Um, OK, I'm going to try this really quick. A uh, little trick you can do, singleton, is to provide an interface uh, familiar to Java developers. Live coding always <coughs> takes more time. Oops. Yeah.
I think this will do it. Yep. Um, so basically, if you wanted to reference uh, the boop on the bippy, uh, basically you can call bippy.git, which would give you a reference to the singleton uh, object, which is a lot nicer than call, calling bippy dollar sign module, uh, and, and then calling the boop on that. This kind of gives you an indirect uh, and nicer path to do that in Java. Um, so I did have a couple other examples, but I ran out of time. Um, but uh, yeah, until then, uh, yeah, just come talk to me later.